Welcome to the, this physical and virtual uh, audience from all over the world to this last panel of the um, Dialogue for Our Future conference here in Dharmasala in northern India. Um, this is actually feels like the end of a marathon over the last two days, as was mentioned a little earlier over lunch. Um, and uh, this record-breaking panel with six speakers uh, is also means that we are ending with a bang. Um, <clears throat> our panel, uh, the fourth panel today, is titled Energy Democracy, Local Solutions in Action. And over the last two days, you know, we have sat here, we have looked at the climate emergency at a global level, uh, how it affects the third pole. We had that session this morning. Uh, we have analyzed what it all means for energy democracy around the world. Uh, and in this last panel, we, we maybe will be zooming in on the local communities and, uh, and local action. In fact, we could paraphrase the title of this panel to say, think globally and act locally. Um, we'll be looking at some real world solutions from our virtual panelists as well as the ones who are here physically from Europe, Asia, sorry about that, and the Americas, um, to the problems that have, um, that we talked about yesterday and today. Um, we have a, so this, with this six panelists, the problem for me as moderator is that I'll have to restrict your time even more, um, so maybe you know, keep your presentations to perhaps five to ten minutes, and uh, we'll then have a discussion um, uh, with questions from the floor here, as well as from our Zoom chat from around the world. And if the previous um, sessions were any indication, as well as the keynote uh, day before yesterday, uh, there will be lots and lots of questions. So uh, it'll be quite challenging to actually uh, get the get them all to fit in. Um, but first off, I'd like to bring in uh, Kenyela Ng, uh, all the way from Hawaii, the other side of the world. Um, he is um, with the uh, organization called Families of the Future, um, which um, works on indigenous rights, as well as, and it's a very interesting concept, educating parents um, to spread awareness among children about the environment. Uh, and, the, um, and perhaps I think we'll, uh, we'll also hear about how successful that has been. Um, so, um, Kenyela, you have the floor for the next five to seven minutes. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but thank you so much uh, for the intro. I want to thank all the organizers, attendees, and uh, fellow panelists for having me and making this wonderful event possible. My name is Kenyela Ng. I'm a spouse to a wonderful feminist champion. I'm a father of two gorgeous boys. Um, I am Kanaka Maoli, that's native to Hawaii for 10 traceable generations. And those are my most important identities, uh, but for credentials and work, um, I co-lead, uh, like you mentioned, a brand new campaign to mobilize millions of parents who are alarmed or concerned about global warming. Um, but for whatever reason, they haven't taken political action. They've seen uh, you know, the youth climate strikes, the sunrise movement, a lot of their own children um, taking really escalated, high risk, high sacrifice actions, going to the streets um, in the millions. Um, but we don't see that in parents, even though that they have much more political power as the most reliable voters, as uh, homeowners. Um, so how do we activate them at scale? Um, it really interests me because I come from the youth movement, but now I'm kind of transitioning out uh, with two kids of my own. So, um, but prior to that, I, I co-led uh, large scale campaigns, the past major federal legislation like the $2 trillion American Rescue Plan and shift the public narrative um, through efforts like Build Back Better, the Thrive Agenda and the Green New Deal. And frankly, a lot of those efforts failed. So now you're gonna see a lot of these campaigns pivot to local action um, where things actually happen. Um, you know, before I did this work, I was a state legislator in Hawaii uh, for three terms and I was a community organizer. So I'm gonna talk real briefly about um, some of the things we're able to do then, but also the limitations and then what we can do to overcome those limitations. So in 
2012, um, the, this is when the idea of reducing your own carbon footprint, which by the way, was invented by the fossil fuel industry as a greenwashing marketing tool. That's when it was really in its heyday, right? Like we all just got to bike and walk um, and drive less. And the worst polluters in the world were blaming people rather than taking responsibility and being accountable for their own um, actions that are dooming our future. Uh, and we were able to, because in Hawaii, we have sunlight all year round and um, it's very expensive to ship oil here, especially with the, with some um, policies like the Jones Act, which requires boats to go to California before it reaches Hawaii. Um, it was, it's really expensive already. Uh, our gas prices are always above $5 a gallon um, USD. Um, so once we did a little bit of solar credits for, for photovoltaic panels on households, um, our distributed generation just kind of exploded. So we were the first state to enact um, that. And with by 2014, the, the cost of solar was like about a dollar lower. It, it was about 50% that of, of gas. Um, and, and then we realized that, you know, if you're uh, most folks in Honolulu, we're one of the densest cities in the world. Um, they don't have access, they can't put solar on the roofs. So we passed the, the first uh, community solar bill, which allows you to use like a nearby Costco um, to, or whatever building has a nice roof um, to kind of act like a mini utility. And then you can all lease it um, from there. Uh, and then we pass on bill financing, which allows you to lease a solar panel to your household. Um, it's just automatically to your utility bill. Um, and, uh, and it's actually cheaper than it's going to be if you're paying your regular bill. And then finally, we're the first state in the nation to pass a 100% renewable energy goal, and that was by 2045. All these same things seemed very wonderful at the time, um, but once you kind of play the tape and you realize how, how when these policies are actually being implemented, how they just don't really work at, at the local level, and then when they do work, um, the, it really increases inequality lots of times. If we have mitigation measures um, that, and adaptation measures that we're, we're giving millions of dollars now to rich beachfront properties to have them move their homes away um, while areas that are being the most polluted already by like our refineries and our coal plants are, have no help at all. Um, the utility is now claiming that they're like the champions of our 100% renewable energy goal while they actually expand um, their, their uh, coal and oil operations. Um, I mean, they're expanding wind too, but you know, there's a net, <laughs> a net loss for, for our planet and people. So what can we do about that, right? Um, I was in office, I'm like, this isn't working, right? So I, 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 I ran for Congress to try to make a bigger crack, didn't get in but realized that like the reason why we couldn't move is every time we tried to do something really meaningful, um, we had the lobbyists come in um, from the fossil fuel industry and there just wasn't enough people power on the other side to, to make it move. So those are all good local solutions, but you know, like people that attend these events, like I, I, I like to attend these, um, speak at these because they tend to be people who have good intentions, they're laser focused and some degree of power, right? And like a lot of you are probably pretty modest about it, but, you know, power as defined as ability to assign roles, um, power defined as organized people, organize, organize ideas or organize money. And, you know, a lot of you probably have institutional power, networks, purse strings, and you're able to direct resources in different areas. So I want to challenge you about like what you're doing with that power. Currently, there's a lot, a lot of investment in, in new technologies, right? Number one, but new technologies are political, like look at liquid natural gas, clean coal, um, nuclear, like the implementation is always gonna to have to happen at scale, it's gonna require government. Um, and we already have the technologies we need to win, we're just not implementing them for political reasons. Um, we also invest in lawsuits. I was part of this big Make Polluters Pay campaign where we got city governments to sue um, Exxon Mobil and Chevron, but the courts are political too. Right. Look at the Stephen Dissinger case. Um, if you don't know, it, I guess Google it. Um, but he sued Chevron and won. And uh, you know, the judge, one of the judges, was like paid has it has an election and was paid by Chevron. And you know, now he's like in house arrest. Um, 
So it's like, okay, it's political. We get it. So we invest in campaigns or to target corporate polluters, right? Like we'll target Exxon, make them toxic. And, you know, it's extremely frustrating. Today was Earth Day. It's still Earth Day in Hawaii. And what started as a radical, disruptive, people-powered, like, rootsy event warped into this International Day of Corporate Greenwashing. And um, corporations are always going to make money. They're going to maximize shareholder profit. In fact, they're legally bound to do so. So, you know, it, what's really important is that we actually shift the conditions um, and focus on the people that uh, create those incentives to begin with. Because as long as people can get filthy rich, destroying our futures and polluting our planet, they will. It's just, you know, how, how the system will work. Uh, so let's target the politicians. So then we invest in clean lobbyists to counter the fossil fuel lobby. Um, and it, it seems to make sense, but our bills still fail, even when we spend millions and millions of dollars on these lobbyists. And, and we invest in elections. We think, okay, our, our bills fail because campaign support, right? If we just donate as much as the other side, um, we'll counter that. Um, that doesn't work either. <laughs> so there's something much bigger and better. And, it, and you know, I did the incubators, I did the startups, I did lawsuits, corporate campaigns, elections, elections, all of it. But now I'm here doing grassroots advocacy. And we target the villains, uh, but who we neglected is the broader public and how we organize ourselves. Um, so, you know, everything we do needs to be targeted at getting more people into the movement, getting more people to put pressure on politicians. Um, when you have, when, you, when you're talking to a politician, I was in office, like you're not, you realize very quickly that these people don't have like individual power. Like power is not monolithic. Power is social. Um, they are standing, every person in power is standing on different pillars, different institutions, be it media conglomerates, um, you know, unions, special interests, corporations, whatever it is, there's a existing alignment that pushes these people up into power. In America, it has, it, it was this alignment started like in the 80s in the Reagan era, and it's still there today. So we need to change that entire alignment. And the only way to do that is to shift the political common sense of the public um, and get people talking to each other. So we need to reach people um, through, or identify them first through very, like, various data, data analytic, analytics and then reach them in ways that we haven't before through every means necessary, knocking on doors, phone calls, ads, billboards, whatever we can do, um, meet them where they are. Um, and, and then we got to get them to act, to do moral protests that take that catches notice. And then we got to train them to repeat this cycle. Um, and that's really the only way change at this scale has ever really worked. Um, look at, you know, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement in Hawaii, Kaho Olave, Mauna Kea. Um, it is mass non-cooperation. So we got to build the building box uh, to get there. So, you know, I grew up in an environmental justice community where it would rain sugarcane ash on us at school while we ran around at, at recess. We called it black snow or Hawaiian snow, but it was poisonous. Uh, most of my friends got some form of respiratory problems like asthma. Uh, we were considered working poor. You know, my father was a server at Union Hotel and he unexpectedly died when I was um, 11. So I was working in the pineapple fields at 14 um, with a shirt tied around my face. So I didn't pass out from 2.14 and glyphosate in the fields. Um, so that is kind of how we're talking about climate change now. It's not just like parts per million or you know, you know, we're sad about glaciers melting and polar bears. It's people will die right now because of pollution, not just natural disasters, but direct pollution. And the thing is, this pollution in due time, in just a matter of a few years to a few decades, um, are going to be killing all of us. It's it's pollution that's overheating the planet. It's really that simple. Um, and what we got to do is just get people to realize that and act accordingly. Uh, so you know, there are things that we can win right now, winnable campaigns, and history shows that. We won acid rain in 1970s. We won ozone, 1980s, recycling, 1990s, litter bug, uh, rainforest in 2000s, pesticides in 2010s. But even when we win, we lose. The yearly climate pollution has more than doubled over the past half century. So, um, you know, we got to just shift the way we're doing things. If we invest just a fraction of what we invest in new technologies, 
in elections, in legislation, into grassroots organizations that are actually going to build people power from the ground up, starting from most impacted communities, we will win. Uh, so that's my final thought. Ganiola. Uh, thank you for highlighting the issues of uh, equity and justice. And here we are um, at the edge of the Tibetan plateau, which is melting, as we heard this morning. Uh, it's warming two to four times faster than the global average. And there you are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, where sea levels are rising. So we see the interconnectedness of it all and also the universality of the impact of, of this global crisis. And uh, I think what you're doing locally um, is part of that you know, drop in the ocean that, that uh, is, is helping us alleviate this. Uh, we, let's move right along, uh, move right along to uh, Eva Gladek, um, who's with the group uh, Metabolic. I like that name. Um, and the, the focus of this organization is on the circular economy. Eva, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here today with all of you and um, already inspired to hear your story, Kanyela. So looking forward to what all the other panelists have to share. I am going to be sharing um, some of the applied community work that we've been doing in the Netherlands. Um, and I do have some slides for this because it's nice to have images to really see some pictures. So if you could put up those slides, whoever is responsible for that. And I will be starting with more of an introduction about myself and metabolic as well. So um, while I'm waiting for these slides to show up, my personal background, um, I'm originally from New York City, but I was raised in the, a very international community. Um, sorry, can you put it to the first slide <laughs> without showing all the slides <laughs> somehow? <laughs> the, yeah, the, I think you're going the wrong way. Um, <laughs> great, a little earlier, <laughs> a little earlier, one more, great, thank you. All right, so um, the, uh, the, I guess the, what I'm presenting today are some case studies from the Netherlands, even though Metabolic does operate globally, um, we are based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and it's, it's useful to see what we've been doing with our home turf. So next slide, please. Um, first, as a bit of context. So I started Metabolic around 10 years ago, and I was deeply frustrated at the time at the lack of real action going on in the world. I saw all of these massive challenges, uh, the continuous uh, you know, approach to various tipping points in the climate and biodiversity system. And so I wanted to create a systems change agency. And Metabolic is not just one uh, organization, it's actually a, an ecosystem of organizations. At the core, we have five main entities, most of which are nonprofits. Um, we have a research institute, a consultancy, a venture building arm, a foundation that works with communities and a software division, and they all work together in a collaborative way to drive forward um, systems change. So next slide, please. They're bound together by one goal, which is to transition the global economy to a fundamentally sustainable state. And we do that in a multifaceted way because there's not a single technology or a single approach that can be used to do that. And we also partner extensively with other groups and networks around the world. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide. I think the most critical thing here is that um, as you mostly, know, as you all probably know, we're in exponential time. So all of these different hockey stick curves that you see here, um, they show the positive feedback loop that we're on, not just when it comes to climate emissions, but also a huge range of other um, impacts on our planet. So around 1950, we started on this um, roller coaster of actually becoming so large as a human species that we're affecting the planetary boundaries and getting close to various tipping points. But I'm showing this because even though we're talking about climate today and about the critical aspects of you know, uh, con con changing our energy system and reducing climate impact, all of these different things are interconnected. They, these different exponential curves, whether we're talking about biodiversity loss or material use or fertilizer consumption um, stem from the same root causes. Next slide. And we need to treat them in an integrated way. So 
if we solve, if we're, this is an example of a systems problem, burden shifting. If you look at these different lighting technologies and someone says, okay, we need to make lighting more efficient because it's using a huge amount of energy in the built environment and that's causing carbon emissions. If you're just thinking about the energy piece, you might say, okay, well, let's replace this incandescent bulb on the left with this um, bulb in the middle, which actually uh, in the US known as a CFL or um, sometimes known as a mercury lamp. Um, so in that way, you're saving a huge amount of energy uh, impact and demand, but you're also introducing mercury, which is a neurotoxin into our homes. Um, and so there, this is an example of burden shifting where you take one problem, uh, you solve it and you potentially create another. So we actually have to have this systemic integrated perspective when we're looking at different solutions. Next slide. So we see it as solving a Rubik's cube puzzle. You can't just focus on one square and figure out where you wanna move it. You actually have to understand the algorithm. You have to understand that all of these different problems are interconnected. And actually, if we do figure out how to identify these algorithms, then we can tackle the root causes of the bigger problems that we're seeing and actually find exponential solutions that can bend those exponential curves that we're riding into problematic areas. Next slide, please. So with our work, with this grand goal of transitioning the global economy, we've divided that into six transitions, uh, human systems that actually need to change, that if we manage to change these human systems, we'll be able to really bend those exponential curves and bring the operations of our economy and our societies within planetary boundaries. And so that's cities and regions, products and services, food and land use, finance, and kind of at the most underlying level, governance and mindset. Because if we cannot change mindsets, then we don't change the rules of the game of the system. And then it becomes very difficult to act above that. Next slide. So uh, we're always looking for leverage points and in uh, systems thinking, those are kind of these magical uh, like silver bullets uh, the, and obviously that's a bit mythical, but either way, they're a place in a system where you can intervene, where action can have an outsized effect. And the reason one of our focal areas is cities and regions is because cities only occupy 3% of the global land surface, but they consume 75% of the resources. So if you imagine that, they're like these global drains with all of this material coming into them. And if you ever want to create an economy that is circular, um, and decarbonized, this is actually where you need to intervene, where you have to take control of those resources and actually loop them back into new green value chains and ideally actually give the people who are most disempowered the access to those value chains and control over those value chains to build a new type of economy. Um, and also cities are responsible directly or indirectly for 60 to 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So if you imagine if we just redesign the way cities function, we can actually fundamentally um, address a lot of those bigger issues that we're talking about. Next slide. So with this kind of systemic integrated approach and the focus on cities, one of the first things that we decided to do as metabolic was to really see, okay, can we take a different bottom-up approach to area development to actually redesigning the way a city would work? And we did this in our home city of Amsterdam. Next slide. So we teamed up with a group of architects um, to develop a project called De Koval. In the north of Amsterdam, uh, which was a very industrialized area when we started operating here, there was a large polluted plot of land which had been a shipyard. So the soil was full of heavy metals and oil um, and the city had bought it from uh, the previous owner of the shipyard and had been holding on to it to turn it into a big, um, to sell it to the highest bidder for, in, for developers to uh, do something with it. But then there was the crisis of 2007 and they decided instead to take a different track and say, okay, anyone who can come up with a great sustainable plan for this site, um, show us what you can do and you can have free use of it for 10 years. So we teamed up with a group of architects um, and we actually developed a concept to take uh, old houseboats that were otherwise gonna be thrown away, um, eco uh, retrofit them, and put them onto the land so we could have like instant buildings and make sure that they were really um, quite energy and uh, material efficient, um, clean the soil using phytoremediation and design a whole plan to close as many of the different resource loops as possible on site. So everything having to do with water, organic waste, actually we even collect urine from the cafe that's on site and put it into a struvite reactor so that we can uh, grow food based on that. So it's really this kind of playground um, and showcase of different circular economy and decarbonization efforts. Next slide. So when we started this, um, we were really uh, 
you know, we really wanted to, to show that something could be done, um, that it's not just theory, that you can actually get stuff into practice. We designed this whole concept. Next slide. And then uh, we suddenly were, for, next slide, forced to actually become a construction company overnight. We had to get a warehouse to collect materials um, because we were committed to using as many reused materials as possible. We had to figure out how to actually redesign and retrofit these different houseboats. Um, raise their roof so that they could be better insulated, change the way that the windows were placed, find huge amounts of uh, wood that was going to be otherwise thrown or burnt, um, thrown away or burnt by the municipality so that it could be used, turned into cladding. Next slide. Um, and in the end, we managed. So uh, together with our partners, we built this whole site, which has these eco-retrofitted houseboats. There's 17 of them on site. There's a cafe and there's our showcase space where we have our, our aquaponics greenhouse and our struvite recycling and all of uh, all of the other things I just mentioned. Next slide. And it's become one of the most popular locations in Amsterdam for tourists and for actually government officials to visit. And I was really surprised to see that it captured so much imagination because in, in the end, it's a very small, weird project, but it actually triggered a cascade of events and a really a significant mindset shift. So this is an aerial view of De Kovel, and you can see all of the different solar panels that have been installed there. Next slide. Um, it also became the site of all sorts of local experimentation. So our goal on site was to be carbon neutral, um, but also we had uh, solar panels installed on the, all the buildings. Um, and we were able to actually also do an experiment to create a blockchain-based renewable energy sharing token to, so that the different boats on site could actually um, trade real-time um, and excess energy uh, in exchange for then, you know, money that they could spend at the cafe locally. So all sorts of different experiments were able to emerge. Next slide. But of course, as I said, this was a small project and we have much larger ambitions of how can you bring this kind of integrated bottom up, top down uh, development um, and actually scale it for, uh, for actually the city level. Um, and one of the things that happened because people were so inspired by the project and the fact that it was actually built is that the city asked us to develop a, a circular economy vision and strategy for the entire neighborhood that this uh, site was located in, this entire post-industrial neighborhood that had similar problems with pollution, um, which we did. And now it's an officially designated circular living lab, which has created a huge change in the way that development has gone on in that area. Next slide. One of the projects in that area is called Schoonschip, which in Dutch translates to clean ship. And it's actually the most sustainable floating housing development in the world. Um, it, uh, you can see a kind of concept sketch of the sustainability plan that we de designed here, which included um, full decarbonization of the buildings, circular material management, but also a lot of different social aspects like collective food purchasing and uh, car sharing and uh, all sorts of other uh, features. So trying to make, make sure that you're taking that Rubik's Cube perspective and not creating one problem when you're solving another. Next slide. This is what Schoonscape looks like today. Um, it's really an amazing project. Uh, it's also something that anyone can visit, although I think they're getting tired of tourists. Um, and uh, you can see that actually as a result of this small weird project with these recycled houseboats, um, that scaled into a neighborhood scale plan, which then influenced and made it po possible to create more and more of these uh, more sophisticated, more replicable plans uh, throughout that neighborhood. So the Koval is just down the water from uh, Schoonschip, which is this location, and dozens of other developments have been taken forward since then. And this is actually a community-driven development. So it has not been created by developers. It's not a commercial project. The community members own this project. Um, they initiated it. They are the ones who hired us to develop the sustainability plan, and they also have been open sourcing all the knowledge that they developed through this process. And there's more and more of these community-driven developments that are moving forward um, with advanced smart grids that they're learning about and all sorts of other uh, cooperative measures that they're sharing. Next slide. And lastly, I wanted to say that, of course, our work has not stopped there. We have uh, scaled on from uh, working in the, in, on this level to working with whole cities and developing whole circular economy strategies for them, and then going and taking that insight from the city level back down to the community level. Next month, if any of you are going to be at Circularity 22 in Atlanta, um, I'm going to be announcing with our partners a new community regeneration fund and a whole kind of program around that that's very exciting. Um, that will allow us to bring more of this to uh, cities around the world and 
Um, this is kind of the approach that we've been taking in the last years. So thank you all, and I'm really excited for the conversation. Thank you, Eva. The, the phrase that struck out for me was, we live in exponential times, and therefore we need an exponential increase in commitment uh, to find systemic solutions. And I'm really glad that the idea that you have sparked in uh, the Netherlands is, seems to be spreading around the world to cities around the world as well. Uh, let's go um, um, to Daniel Cohen, who's uh, <clears throat> with the socio spatial, sorry about that, socio spatial um, collaborative with the University of California in Berkeley. It's quite a tongue twister. Thank you. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a huge honor to be here. And my strategy of making the institute I run unpronounceable, hopefully successful, making it seem so complex, so scientific. Um, so uh, I am a sociologist at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'm actually a Canadian and the son of a Guatemalan immigrant to Canada. So I've been kind of moving around. Um, I direct the SC2, um, as you just mentioned, as well as I co-direct Climate and Community Project, which is a new progressive climate policy um, think tank. I've spent about 10 years researching housing and climate politics, uh, both as a qualitative field worker in Sao Paulo and in New York City, and then as, as the head of a, interdiscip a sort of our interdisciplinary quantitative team. So I'm gonna talk mainly about housing and climate today, and I wanna make a simple point. Climate justice or even effective climate action is impossible without housing justice. Climate breakdown and eviction are two of the great existential threats that people face and neither can be solved alone. Um, I may be a bit biased. This is the topic that I work on uh, in my academic work and also in my policy work. Um, I led the research for the Green New Deal for Public Housing Act, which was introduced to the US Congress by Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, a couple of years ago, the first concrete bill of the Green New Deal. So let me just say a bit more about my argument. First, I think it's technically impossible to eliminate carbon pollution from home and eliminate health threats without a housing justice approach. Most people in the world live in low-income housing. And so we need to develop and deliver green home improvements and build new green affordable housing that fit the very diverse context of those communities that are all over the world. And in some cases, we might get some help from uh, Eva, it sounds like. Um, second, uh, and maybe more important, Housing-oriented social movements are powerful, powerful political protagonists, especially in cities. Fundamentally, to decarbonize cities will take money. Um, progressives generally want to tax the wealthy and in industries like real estate to generate that, that funding, whereas more conservative uh, political actors often want to pass the cost of the green transition on to low-income people, or sometimes to simply get those people out of sight. Uh, in those cities. That's a version perhaps of, of burden shifting. Um, so the question is, what is the role of housing movements in all of this? And what I'm going to argue is that housing movements will, I think, appropriately resist green improvements in cities that threaten to displace poor and working class people, push them out into slums, they're out of sight. On the flip side, they can join progressive coalitions for green urban improvements that will help uh, people who live in low-income housing and working class housing in a serious way. Um, I wanna just start, uh, or as I'm continuing this argument, I wanna say a word about what we're not, I think, arguing for. I'd say right now in the United States, the big dream of low carbon housing is an elitist and impossible dream for most people. It's the dream of an upper middle class house in the suburbs with a Tesla in the driveway, a solar panel on the roof, and a big battery in the garage. I would say that in Brazil, which I know well, and possibly in India, that dream would include a wall around the house with barbed wire and crushed glass on top to keep anybody from getting in. And I don't think that is a green housing solution for humanity. Um, there's another solution, uh, another version of this, which is about making cities greener. And unfortunately, that often looks like a verticalization of the suburban dream, stacking up energy uh, efficient homes, but only for the elite in gleaming towers. They might travel by electric Ubers electric scooters, maybe electric rickshaws. Um, and, and once again, everybody else is just pushed out of the picture, relegated to, um, to slums or informal settlements, often on the peripheries of cities. 
Um, in Sao Paulo and in New York City, I've talked with housing movement organizers, with environmentalists, with city planners, uh, over 200 in this research. And what I found is that you have had many cases of this kind of luxury green city development that is really by and for uh, economic elites, workers in tech sectors, a small portion of the overall city. And in many cases, housing movements fought back against that. Housing movements didn't always talk about carbon when they have fought over equity in their cities. Often housing movements say, we're fighting for housing as a human right. And then the environmentalists say, ah, but you're getting in the way of our densification or of our green redevelopment. But the thing is that what housing movements in cities around the world, for the most part led by working class women of color who are black or brown, South Asian, uh, Latina, you name it, for the most part what those movements are actually defending is extremely low carbon. They are defending the idea of affordable housing, near jobs, near services, near public transit. That is a green dream actually worth defending. And housing movements are out there fighting very hard, very often in the streets, defending the right of working class people and poor people to live near jobs, near transit, and near services. And this got translated ultimately into action. In Sao Paulo and in New York in the 2010s, more progressive mayors were elected. In Sao Paulo, the housing movement used its political muscle to support the passage of an award-winning green master plan that expanded public transit, densified along the axes of public transit, funded and zoned for affordable housing in precisely those areas that were getting improved by public investment. So the housing movements were so active, they found a way to get a compromise between real estate development, in some cases, affordable housing development, and public transit expansion. In New York City, a very powerful housing movement, inspiring movement called New York Communities for Change has played an incredible role. It used its political power, its might, its influence over progressive politicians to ensure that New York City passed in 2019 the country's most ambitious low carbon buildings bill. But that bill had protections for tenants and it required that large building owners decarbonize their buildings. And I wanna emphasize the role that housing played here and how it changed New York City's climate politics. Again, this was called the Green New Deal for New York City, the most ambitious urban low carbon bill in the United States. I was at the city council when that bill was passed. It was three years ago, Earth Week, 2019. And a city councilor, Costa Constantinidis, gave a short speech. Uh, he was the author of the bill itself that was gonna go and pass. And he said, we have to pass this bill today so that when mothers go to sleep at night, they don't worry about their children being displaced by rising seas or by rising rents. By rising seas or by rising rents. It was a profound moral statement and it was a savvy political move. New York's real estate industry, which is one of the most powerful lobby groups in the world, was opposed to this green buildings bill. But the housing movement and its allies were strong enough to pressure the city's politicians to vote for the bill anyway. And I would propose, based on my research, what I have seen around the world over and over, when it comes to ethics, when it comes to housing struggles, when it comes to fighting climate change, there is a clear and simple alignment. Climate justice is housing justice. Thank you. Thank you, David. You've uh, not just pointed out the problem, but also several solutions from around the world. Uh, Sao Paulo, New York, elsewhere, and where you live in California, obviously housing is a big issue. Um, but you've also shown how you can scale it up to a city level, uh, both to tackle um, the climate crisis as well as social justice. Uh, we're really sorry that, um, you know, for the time difference between the various panelists and us here in India, um, we tried to have it at a more civilized hour for everyone, but unfortunately the the planet is not configured that way. Um, the next speaker is uh, Shia Bastida, and she's from Colombia. Uh, and uh, it's 3 a.m. where she is, so I'm really, really uh, glad that you're still awake and uh, looking bright. Um, where you, um, we, you know, we heard you at uh, Glasgow in COP26, uh, was it? Oh, yeah, I get confused. COP26, and it was a very inspiring speech. And I think a lot of uh, young people, young activists around the world were inspired by your uh, talk. Um, and we'd really like you to 
uh, you know, give us a short recap of what has happened in Glasgow. Where have you, where are you going, and um, uh, how things are going for you, um, Shia. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here uh, among such inspiring people. And I was actually there as well at the city council uh, when the bill was passed. And I've also, you know, been part of that. Um, all of the movement in, in New York City and New York State to pass the Climate and Leadership Community Protections Act and all of these different bills that have made a huge difference in the way that New York City um, is going to adapt to the climate crisis. Um, so my name is Shia Bastida. I am a climate justice activist and I'm actually from Mexico, half Mexican, half Chilean. And I was raised in the Otomi Toltec community called San Pedro Tultepec in the highlands of central Mexico. So uh, that meant that the way that my parents raised me was through a lens of reciprocity and a lens of community, kind of community justice, community building, community self-care. Um, I think the principles that I was raised with, including intergenerational cooperation, where it, this is very common in indigenous communities, uh, youth and elder circles, where youth talk to elders so that we can learn from their wisdom, but they can also get ignited with our energy. So it's a cycle of moving around energy and wisdom, which I think has been missing in the overall climate movement. Um, in 2015, my hometown suffered from flooding and that was, I was 13 years old and that showed me that everything that my parents had been talking about because they have both, they had both been working in academia and the environmental sector for my whole lives, uh, both having, um, you know, PhDs and degrees in sustainable development, everything that they had been talking about had materialized. Uh, and shortly after, I moved to New York City, where I saw the effects that Hurricane Sandy had had on Long Island and the broader uh, New York City community. And that's when I realized that the climate crisis is happening all over the world, and that us as children and teenagers and our future children are going to be the most affected. For me, this was not only an issue of intergenerational injustice, but also an issue of um, of racial injustice, of migrant injustice, knowing that most of the, uh, the harshest effects of the climate crisis are disproportionately affecting people in the global south, uh, disproportionately affecting communities like mine in Mexico. Even though we are the ones who are uh, the least carbon intensive and probably have some of the best principles and uh, solutions for a mindset shift that can actually get us towards the world that we that we deserve. And so when I um, became more settled in New York City, um, I decided that I couldn't wait to grow up like my parents and get a job in the environmental sector. I knew that I had to start acting because, uh, you know, the IPCC report, the climate scientists and my own experiences showed me that we couldn't wait on, on acting on the climate crisis. So I started organizing. I started organizing climate strikes up to 300,000 people in New York City um, for the September 20th climate strike. And now that I'm in, in university and I'm doing a degree on Latinx, uh, Latinx studies and also environmental studies, I have become more and more aware of what environmental injustice actually means. In the United States, there's something called the Serral Report which is a report that different companies use to map communities based on their level of education, their racial makeup, and also the overall political power. So a lot of facilities, um, noxious facilities, waste uh, facilities, incinerators, are cited on communities that are seen as having the least political power. These communities are mostly um, you know, it can be indigenous communities, Spanish speaking communities, migrant communities. And this, um, you know, all of the things that that have happened from the siding of unjust of noxious facilities, um, I think we are all around the same through line, which is climate justice is social justice. 
And we cannot solve the climate crisis without knowing that all of our technologies on renewable energy, a lot of our technologies for a transition have to be centered around, um, you know, giving rights to all of these communities and focusing on energy democratization, focusing on the needs of the community, uh, which is something that companies don't like to do because it's easy to see, to break up a community. It's easy to build a highway through a community. It's easy to uh, see the rates of cancer increase and the political power decrease. So I think that we are here together to say that we're not gonna let that happen any longer. And there's many case studies that, um, that show that community power is one of the most important things that can leverage policy and can leverage um, kind of this type of systemic solutions. So another uh, case study in New York City is Sunset Park, which is, has been led by an organization called Uprose. And they are a community that is in Brooklyn, which is one of the fastest developing parts of um, New York City. And a developer came and said, I wanna give $1 billion to rebuild this, this part of the city, put in retail and put in hotels and skyscrapers and residential, but it would all be high end. And that community is primarily Hispanic, over 40% Hispanic and over 30% Southeast Asian. And they don't have the money to be able to stay in a community that is so developed and in, in a way that would push them out because the prices would, would rise up, uh, which is what Daniel was talking about. Um, and so what they have done is build a huge coalition and not only uh, do a, a report on the environmental impacts of what this new development would entail, but uh, give a proposal for a different type of rezoning uh, that would actually um, keep the community uh, with the jobs that the community wants to have, uh, keep all the retail and development out of the community, and also ensure that it is all done through a lens of climate justice. So how do you retrofit buildings to be more energy efficient? How do you make sure that the harbor, uh, because they're right next to the, to the Hudson River, how do you make sure that um, when rising sea levels come, it doesn't um, negatively impact the community? And so all of these were things that the developers were not thinking about. And they were able to keep out um, the, the new developments that were actually going to harm them more than help um, more than help them. And so these are just examples of, and they also have community solar, which is something that I really wanted to mention after what Daniel said. Uh, so they are part of this movement in New York City and New York State of democratizing energy and really a movement of all over the country and all over the world. Um, because we have talked a lot about energy security and what that means and how it means for different places. And, you know, uh, we don't really think about what it means to create grids that are independent and grids that are, uh, you know, community shared. And I think that all of these examples that I'm giving, um, I am doing to show that the youth climate movement is not stuck in just saying we want you to do better for the planet, but really trying to understand the intricacies of what a just transition to renewable energy means for across the world and um, understanding what justice means in the movement towards a better planet. So I will end um, by saying that we must all recognize that the climate crisis is the biggest threat that we've ever faced, but it's also our biggest opportunity to come together, to build a resilient world, a just oriented world, where people are valued and are given the dignity that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Shia. Uh, I must apologize right in the beginning for uh, my mistake. You are actually uh, Mexican Chilean and you're living in New York. Um, <clears throat> but you've really, um, I actually admire how lucid you are even at 3 a.m. in New York. But you've really brought together the issues of migration, urbanization, climate, and social justice, uh, and how they all interact together in, in uh, one place. 
and we are really full of admiration for you for your, um, you know, your um, commitment and responsibility to the cause of justice. Um, I would like now to uh, ask uh, the two panelists who are here with us physically um, to, to give their presentations. First is um, Sechu Dolma, who's, uh, who's from Tibet and uh, whose family lived as refugees in a very remote part of Nepal. Uh, and um, she's now, um, after education, she's now the founder of the Mountain Resiliency Project uh, that has worked uh, on relief and rehabilitation of survivors of the 2015 earthquake uh, in Nepal, which exacerbated some of the other impacts from uh, the climate crisis in the Himalayas as well. Uh, Situ, you have the floor. Well, actually, I started mountain resiliency when I was 18 years old, 10 years ago. So 2015 earthquake was just one of those peg in your wheels <laughs> as you're going. So. When I first started Mountain Resiliency at age 18, um, I, I had just started university, um, I started my undergraduate, and it was so incredible for me, like being at Columbia University, you've been there, and you see all the privilege and all these resources, and you just think, oh my goodness, like that's not the type of world my family comes from. I've never seen this much access in my life because I had, the, I had the most transformative childhood, um, being able to experience living with a nomadic family uh, in, in eastern Tibet, in the Kham region, um, my father's family, and then, then coming to Nepal and being able to live in a Tibetan refugee community and being you know, moved around in different Tibetan refugee camps and seeing, you know, traveling with the landscape, seeing the geography changed, seeing people's socioeconomic, um, status has changed, seeing, um, just seeing geopolitical issues within your life, um, within your childhood experience. It was really, really, um, like it always struck, stuck with me. And then with everything that happened during the Maoist insurgency and seeing how vulnerable Tibetan refugees were at that time, seeing that we were not going to have any local government protection, we were not going to have um, the United Nations or intergovernmental agencies stepping, on, stepping in on our, on our behalf. And then seeing, um, I mean, the CTA, the Tibetan exile government does great work, but then they were being made to go further and further underground in Nepal. So having lived through all of that and seeing that, you know, when I was growing up, there was about 25 to 30,000 Tibetan refugees in Nepal. And now there's about, there's a lot less than that. Um, we don't know the exact numbers, but my guess would be between 15 to 20,000. And with the populations that we've worked with in mountain resiliency, we specifically targeted the borderland region between Tibet and Nepal because it's a very fluid, well, it used to be a very fluid border, but even now in terms of pe people's ethnicities, people's, um, how we all get marginalized by the, um, by the other caste in power, um, it's still very, our identities are very fluid and there is a lot of solidarity and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of similar experiences in the borderlands. But then now with um, the Chinese government's influence open, um, openly encroaching into Nepal's sovereignty, um, we're seeing a lot more issues like, with um, one of the villages we work with, um, a district in Nepal, Mustang. Um, in Mustang, you've, we've historically had Tibetans there for, um, I mean, Mustangis are from Tibet at one point, and we have very strong cultural ties, but because of um, the aid the aid that the Chinese government has been um, giving out to local families, this gap between the Tibetan nomads uh, who still live up in the grasslands in, uh, in Mustang and who also have a refugee camp within Mustang, you see the gap between um, the local Mustangis and the Tibetan refugees growing and then the access to education, health, um, finance, all of this is only exacerbate, uh, is only being exacerbated the, the gaps to these access. So we had to step in to ensure that, you know, 
our communities are being looked out for. And, you know, we didn't really start with much. Um, we just started with my childhood friends. That's all, like, it was a group of me and my childhood friends. And we just thought, okay, this is what we know. And we're just going to make, make everything up as we go. And we made a lot of mistakes. It was all improvised. And it was a lot of mistakes. And even to the point where as we grew and as the earthquake happened, you know, you just... I, I was, what, 22, 23 years old when the earthquake happened, and you have, like, all these phone calls coming about, oh, we need this, we need that, and then you see that the local government's not doing anything, so you just, even though your work is on agriculture, you suddenly have to pivot and start building houses for a nunnery that's up in, like, 12,000 feet above sea level, and and you're only like 30 kilometers from the Tibet border and you have a spy coming in every time from the Chinese border to see what you're doing. And so being, having to juggle all of these, um, having to juggle all of these different moving parts and different actors, um, you make a lot of mistakes and you also learn that when you're young and you're very, like as a youth activist, a lot of us are very, very passionate about, you know, maybe because we don't have like all the bad experience and <laughs> all the bad experiences and the trauma of uh, bureaucracy. Um, we stepped on too many toes you know, to the point where we had to, you know, we were getting kicked out of Nepal because we could, you know, we were pissing off a lot of foreign bodies, like specifically the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having to then worry about our existence, like what do we do now? Our, our projects are still going. We have all these families that we're responsible for. Then having to come up with ways about, okay, how do we start getting acquired or how do we acquire another nonprofit or how do we get acquired by another nonprofit who will do our work and who will continue our vision? So we had to do that. We had to um, find local institutions that are small enough where um, they're small enough that they're very community-based, and but then they also need the, the capacity building support from us. So finding the, these type of synergies and having our work continue this way has been one of the most um, one of the most rewarding um, experiences for me. And then, so what do you do once you like, Kanyela? You mentioned. Um, you know, as a youth activist, there's a retirement phase, you know, you have to start retiring from being a youth activist at one point. You can't be a youth forever. And so what do you do when, you know, you go back to school, you go to graduate school, that's where you go to retire. And so naturally, I went to business school and law school, because I thought, okay, maybe I can learn, um, you know, get institutional knowledge from these places and, you know, start putting words to, words to the work that we had already done and start understanding, oh, there's actual frameworks, there's actual, like, stakeholder mapping, uh, you know, proper frameworks you can use to do these things, there's forms for these, there's, like, proper ways of creating an audit trail, learning all of these things where, you know, that's what you do in your um, youth activist retirement phase. So, and then when, once, I got to, once I got to business school, um, you know, naturally I did an MBA and I learned that mining is a renewable resource. <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding. That, that's what my business school taught me, that mining industry, like specifically it was an example of mining in the highlands of Bolivia, a Canadian company, and it was providing renewable um, resources to the local indigenous community. And my mind was like blown. I was like, what do you mean mining is a renewable resource? This is the most extractive industry out there. Like, you're a Canadian company coming into Bolivia and you know, you're poisoning all these people. But then once I started learning about why and how mining could be a renewable resource, it just, I mean, I can talk about this later if you want to talk about how, what their logic was behind how mining is a renewable resource. Um, I can talk about it later. But it just, going back to school and learning about, learning about how to put words, how to, 
create the proper frameworks, those have all been like really, really, really helpful for me. And this is what, I mean, I, encur I encourage other youth activists out there who are thinking about, you know, what are next steps? Like, how do we carry our momentum forward? How do we, you know, as we near our retirement, what do we do to um, continue this work? And yeah, so being a Tibetan, I feel like every single room I go to, like my mom always tells me, like every single room you go to, just make sure you ask a question or you bring up something about Tibet. And they're always like, you make sure you bring up 1959, no matter where you go. And, and when I was a kid, I thought, okay, that is really absurd. I don't know why I need to do this all the time. But then as I started reading more and I started, um, like my parents have never ever been to school. They've, they've had no, um, both my parents have never had any formal education and so education was really important for them that the children can have. And when I was reading Maya Angelou, I, I read her quote. Um, so Maya Angelou is a famous Nobel, a Nobel Prize winning um, author, American. And she had this quote that said, um, your ancestors have paid for your crown and it is time for you to put it on, like wear it, Wear it and own it, something along those lines. Um, but, and it really st stuck to me, you know, the fact that our, you know, our ancestors, like our, my parents, uh, Tibet support groups, that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan community, there's already been so many, there's already been so many sacrifices made. Like Dr. Lopsan Lawat said earlier about, um, you know, dedicating the panel to all the Tibetan environmental activists and other environmental activists in autocratic states who've put their lives at stake um, for doing things that are very like simple to us in a free world. Um, just owning the crown and putting it on, on our head and stepping out to the world, I think that's what I want to leave this panel with. Great. Yeah, thank you for that really moving presentation and how you've dealt with and overcome uh, the geopolitical, geographical, personal challenges that you faced along the way to be where you are today. And also from one retiree to another. <laughs> 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 and maybe uh, Kaniela can give some advice to Techu here about what to do after retiring from youth. Um, <laughs> But let's uh, go right away because we don't have uh, much time left um, uh, for questions otherwise. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Amit Thakur. He's with the Tata Energy Research Institute here in India. Uh, and his work uh, uh, deals um, actually globally with energy democracy. And he's got this initiative going called Lighting a Billion Lights. Uh, which essentially tries to bring light to uh, poorer communities around the world uh, with uh, very cheap solar solutions. Uh, and uh, I hear that uh, there are already 2.5 million beneficiaries around the world. Dr. Thakur. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit, esteemed uh, panelist uh, present here and online. I'm extremely thankful to the organizer for uh, organizing such a wonderful event, uh, which is very focused. The two days focused largely on such issues which are very relevant today. I'm also thankful to uh, Dr. Gunther Kulanya, Director of UAC Research. Uh, uh, he has been here uh, throughout and, and, and to all the participants. Uh, uh, we need to, you know, uh, at, the, at the fourth session, uh, keeping your energy intact is, is a bit difficult, and that too uh, post-lunch. But thank you very much for uh, being present here. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, Terry uh, was established in 1974, and we are going to complete uh, 50 years of our presence in India, and we have presence uh, across the globe. We believe uh, uh, our, our philosophy uh, and our principle and our vision is to work on energy environment and sustainable development. And we have been uh, at the national you know, map and, and in the global map also through our work. Uh, uh, as you know uh, that uh, the Panch Tattwa concept uh, uh, in India, uh, which, which focus on uh, uh, Jal, Vayu, uh, uh, 
अग्नि आकाश और 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 एंड एंड जमीन सो दिस फाइव थिंग्स आर ऑल ऑल इंटैक्ट इन आवर क्लाइमेट फिलोसफी एंड इन आवर क्लाइमेट प्रिंसिपल इफ यू यू नो रेस्पेक्ट ऑल दिस फाइव प्रिंसिपल्स स्ट्रांगली देन आई थिंक देर वुड बी नो इश्यू इन द एंटायर ग्लोब टेरी वॉज द फर्स्ट वन टू कम विद दिस हंड्रेड ईयर प्लान ऑन हाउ इंडिया कैन बी can go on a low carbon path from uh, from its independence uh, since 1947 till 2047 so that has already been published and we have been promoting it strongly and have been advising the government of india and the state governments to to go forward uh, in this direction so we uh, are a strong uh, strong advocate of uh, uh, climate change and we always believe that uh, whatever we say whatever the world says we must put that into action and and taking forward this uh, uh, this concept uh, of you know on a low carbon path terry uh, practices this we have our uh, 100 uh, acre campus uh, on the ncr in gurgaon close to delhi and that campus is a uh, 100% you know carbon neutral campus we produce our own uh, you know uh, electricity that runs you know a, a training facility which comprises of 30 rooms uh, we have our own micro propagation park our forestry uh, region we use the uh, water recycle the water use it in horticulture purpose and we have several such in- initiatives within the campus in in delhi Uh, 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 so uh, uh, again, uh, we have a center in Nainital also in the hilly area where we uh, cl- work very closely with the community at large. And what we believe that uh, you know we try to promote concepts like rainwater har- harvesting in the hills uh, because you know hilly area is highly rain-fed, and there we work very closely with the community and we help them to augment their incomes also. We have produced several products uh, in close community uh, association in Uttarakhand like the herbal products, uh, herbal tea. Uh, 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 apple jams and many such project uh, products which are used by us at Terry and also we provide to many people uh, you know uh, who are interested in using that product not on a commercial scale uh, uh, space but on a on a you know at least one can use those product which are which produce for the community so uh, 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 Terry believes in in in, in the fact that uh, whatever we do uh, we do it in such a manner that you know our projects program work on a uh, uh, low carbon path we work in such a manner that our projects in fact uh, are well designed to address various issues on ground and we believe in an action oriented strategy uh, I, i i belong to a division which uh, uh, i heard in fact uh, uh, the energy access program i'm also part of the corporate social responsibility so there is a, uh, and also i work with the government in fact so if you see the whole you know uh, value chain uh, uh, for me also i work on the ground a lot uh, with the community Uh, in the energy access program and in the integrated development program we work with the corporate sector uh, who need to be sensitized and where the funding also comes and also we try to you know at the policy front we try to you know motivate the governments so this is how the entire framework goes in terms of work and every project program that we uh, have designed we try to see that the most vulnerable who are least responsible for climate change are 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 you know not affected and their voice comes to us very strongly and we capture those voice and every project that we design is new innovative and it addresses the aspect of climate change so with this view i will uh, quickly run through uh, with a with with the energy access program which is called the lighting a billion life program which was initiated in 2007 and first uh, and, and the issue was that you know uh, 1.2 billion uh, people across the globe don't have access to you know basic energy lighting part and also it added to uh, to the cooking part also that that almost uh, a similar number of people don't have access to you know uh, quality cooking in fact they are highly dependent on on traditional system which produces lot of pollution indoor pollution is there household pollution is there and that leads to so much of problem so i'll quickly run through uh, 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 the framework of that uh, 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 that program and and how we have you know impacted so many people across the globe and especially in india so i'll request uh, you know uh, the 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 main managers to just if you can place the uh, uh, ppt uh, so uh, uh, the first page to the extreme right if that can be you know uh, uh, the size could be you know uh, uh, could be maximized the picture on the extreme right maximize yeah yeah uh, yeah to the yeah to, uh, to the right to, to my right yeah <laughs> to my right the other way yeah the other way yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, you know uh, uh, in 2007 tedi started this program called lighting a billion lives program 
in India, uh, seeing the larger issue that uh, there is some issue, you know, people don't have access to basic lighting. And, and based on that, we designed a program. Initially, it was a lighting a million lives. We thought million lives would be enough. So it was supported initially by Clinton Foundation in 2007. But we again thought that the, the issue is paramount. The issue is not small. Nationally, also, we have to address almost 50% of 1.2 uh, billion people. And it's a global issue also. We reached to Africa also, to some extent, Nepal also, and some other countries. But major focus was in India. So it started with the basic lanterns, in fact, solar lanterns, uh, uh, which was new to, uh, to, to many in, in, in our country. And we reached out on a revenue model uh, through entrepreneur model, through enterprise development model, that you know, solar lanterns are key in you know, providing light. And they also help in education, health, and other you know, affiliated solutions. So uh, that program uh, 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 worked on an uh, entrepreneurial model. And for four or five years, the basic lighting was in place. We didn't just give the solar lanterns, but we also uh, designed around that you know, entrepreneurial program, enterprise development was done. And this was majorly for rural India. We found that there, there was no light available, uh, uh, quality, quality light was not available, and that too was available for very less number of hours. So this helped a lot in their education, health, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, strengthening their livelihoods. So uh, so if, if you understand, if there is no light, and if one can get light, then how much, you know, it, it can bring change. So in five years, from 2007 to 12, we went ahead this. There were a lot of changes in the model, and subsequently we added a new a new dimension, new technology uh, to the existing basic lighting. We then went to this IDES model, which is a combination of lighting and, and cooking also. We, 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 we provided you know, uh, the uh, energy efficient cook stoves, uh, which runs on biomass, and that was much uh, more efficient compared to this, uh, uh, to this uh, regular you know, traditional uh, chulhas that are uh, being used across our country. So again, uh, that was provided, that helped in enhancing you know, uh, uh, utilization of uh, 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 so, uh, solar technology, and also on the other hand, uh, in tandem, it helped to you know, reduce the dependency on, on burning of fuels in terms of a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, a lot of wood was being being burned, so it also reduced that part. Again, from there we uh, moved ahead. The technology upgradation was happening, and also uh, we were the one who were pushing the industry also strongly to see that you know uh, uh, there, there's a huge demand uh, in the Indian market and outside also. And you know economies of scale always helps to bring down the cost. And we have seen that in fact uh, how the you know uh, uh, the renewable price and especially the solar price from 2000 to 2000 town has come down, and even in 2020, the price was even lesser than some of the, you know, uh, uh, fossil fuel prices if you compare on an average average basis. So uh, then we uh, came 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 to the SMG model. Uh, that was, you know. Uh, uh, a model in which we gave a centralized lighting solutions in a village and that addressed 100 households and, and that was solar microgrids that we say and that catered light to 100 households. So this is how we scaled up our work across the country. Next phase of the project was we uh, enhanced the livelihood aspect that how uh, with time we progressed. Livelihood aspect means that people in India uh, uh, are, are, are running several type of li livelihoods and especially at the village level. In Banaras, I, I would like to give an example that we took up the boats uh, which run on the Ganga Ghats and we solarized them. So that runs on diesel, uh, but again, we the charging station was set at the Ghats and the battery was on the on the boats and that's how, you know, hybrid model was created. We also created models for weavers, uh, the Sadi weavers in Banaras cluster and also in the Renukut uh, cluster and, and also in the Allahabad uh, uh, cl uh, cluster in which the weavers, you know, who produce, who, who used to produce Sadi, uh, eight Sadis uh, a, 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 a in a month. Uh, 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 and th those are small weavers. Uh, they, uh, after the intervention of solar hybrid model, they used to produce 13 to 14 uh, 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 sadis, and that augmented their income. And also, the load on electricity came down, and it was a hybrid model, and usage of uh, 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 solar was promoted. So this is how the entire program moved ahead. And today, we stand at a place where now we are seeing that how you know integrated model can can be developed. We are doing several projects across the country. We have uh, put solar also when we go to a village, we do a detailed mapping, we take the inputs from the villagers, from the, from the community who are most vulnerable, and we capture their uh, you know, uh, uh, anxiety, we try to capture their need, and based on that, we are also trying to develop 
and we are doing projects on ground uh, uh, integrated model in which we are trying to develop uh, uh, water structures, water bodies. We are giving solar solutions. We are helping them to increase the agricultural output. And we are also seeing to the fact that how the entire village can become sustainable. And we have done uh, all these uh, things across the country in many places. And this is uh, how our entire journey is moving forward. So th thank you very much. So just quickly on the impact part, we have covered uh, uh, on the 24 villages, in fact, in India, and and and, uh, and we have reached out to 2.5 million uh, population, and we we, pro we intend to move ahead. So more we'll discuss later. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry to cut you short. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this is a, a remarkable uh, example of enlightened corporate involvement in funding innovation. Uh, and then how that project then works at the government level with the private sector as well as the grassroots. Uh, but we have to move on fast because we only have 40 minutes left and we have six panelists. I'm sure you're all itching to ask questions. But let me go first to a Zoom chat question right away which might be addressed by perhaps uh, Kanyela and Shie. Um, how can indigenous people, especially in countries like India and Nepal, who are less educated and have limited access to information, stay informed and be brought to understand the climate crisis and solutions. Kanyela, can you go first? Did you get the question? Well, I was just gonna kick it over to you. Did you hear that? Sorry, the higher press means. Okay, yeah. uh, Shia, did you hear that? Okay, can you, can you go first? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so, this is a very important question because when we think of indigenous communities, I think we do have a misconception of kind of the knowledge and wisdom that indigenous communities hold. And so the first uh, step to making um, to making this kind of like cross-cultural pollination of solutions happen is definitely the language barrier. So a lot of indigenous communities know only their language and maybe the um, the language of their country, but it's the education has to happen in, in the language of the community. So I think that's a, a specific way in which information can be brought to indigenous question. communities. Um, another, another way is really uh, listening to indigenous wisdom when talking about climate solutions. So in my own hometown, there was a university that was built on top of our wetland that actually sunk because this, the planners didn't listen to the community when they said, this is an unstable area that has been unstable for you know all the time that we've been here. And so if you don't listen to the indigenous knowledge of an area, the people who know the area best, uh, you are bound to make a mistake. So I think that um, that is also a very, very important part of knowing that all solutions are not going to work the same everywhere, that solutions need to be tailored to the community. And the last part I'll say is that we have a lot to learn from Indigenous wisdom and a lot to learn from principles of Indigenous communities, starting with the reciprocity. Um, I can take, but I can also give back. Also, um, like I said before, intergenerational cooperation. And I think most importantly, just seeing the world in, in a way that is in harmony with nature and in relationship with nature. So I think if humanity switches to a principles of um, respecting Mother Earth, I think it one is one of the most important steps we can take. Yeah, thank you. We also have in the audience physically here present Elizabeth Watuti from Kenya who gave the keynote speech. If you'd like to uh, take that question up a little later, uh, you'll, you'll be, the microphone's behind you. The question was about how indigenous communities can learn about climate change, which is a global thing in, in, in our countries. Thank you. I would just uh, say in addition, and one of the best ways that indigenous communities... You have to turn on your mic. It's on. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I would say one of the best ways that also indigenous communities can get to learn is to actually make sure that they are being involved. Because if you look at some of the climate change conversations, we still have the indigenous communities being sidelined out of the things in which they're trying to do and actually giving them the platforms to educate the world, giving them the platforms to allow 
their knowledge to also feed into the climate conversations would be one of the ways in which we continue to empower them because these are the people who are protecting the resources that we try to talk about every day. They are the people who every day are trying to remind the world that we cannot live, with, live without nature, we cannot live without these resources. So we can never afford to not include them to be part of the conversations because they're the ones who are doing the work on the ground. And I think when we talk about grassroots communities, we can never talk about grassroots communities without indigenous communities in mind. And sometimes these are the people who do not even have rights to their own land, and yet they are trying to protect these lands. And we talk about how technology is going to save us every day, but the truth is, it's not technology that is going to save us. We have already been doing most of these things and solutions that we talk about every day. People who are connected to their roots, people who are connected to nature and the environment are the ones who still continue to protect the planet. So without the indigenous communities and all these grassroots movements, it's going to be impossible for us to say that we are inventing new things to help save the planet. So indigenous knowledge is something that we need to continue bringing into the rooms because these people have been doing it every other day. It's just that we are not listening to them. It's just that we are not giving them the platforms and we are not making sure that their message is spreading far and wide. So we have to integrate all this together in everything that we are trying to do. Daniela, would you like to add on that? No, I mean, these are, those are brilliant answers. I just draw something in the chat too for those online. But, um, you know, one example of, of this kind of gone awry is our national policy in the US on forest fires um, with a big Smokey the Bear campaign. Um, and the policy was to just to um, try to clear uh, uh, as much space as possible um, and stop the burn and what that happened was it would get closer and closer to communities. People couldn't figure out why. Um, and when indigenous communities were trying to tell them, look, all you need to do is burn this certain area to stop the flame from spreading, um, a, a light burn, they called it. Um, they were actually criminalized every time they tried to do it, they, they would get arrested. Um, but now scientists are coming around and realizing they're right all along. So even though um, our science isn't always empirical um, or done the same way as it's done in the West. It doesn't make it wrong. I mean, Hawaii, the, uh, the uh, is it, I don't know, the NOAA, I think, banned certain coral species that were known to be invasive, but in certain areas, um, they're, they're needed. So uh, people were moving them um, as were, as like our practice were for seven generations now in order to restore fisheries. Um, and they were also arrested um, because you're not supposed to touch this this um, rare um, uh, coral, even though it's invasive in the area. So um, just like listening to folks first, I think is the number one thing, uh, and centering them in our decision making. Do you want to add? Add the ones, Sorry. Uh, and, and I think the deeper core of this is like, which I wrote about the article, is like it boils down to: it, do we have systems that are extractive, or do we have systems that are regenerative? And we need to move to a system that's regenerative, um, as Eva laid out in her circular economy talk. Um, and the people who mastered that for generations were indigenous people. Thank you. Situ? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Liz, what you said, the knowledge is there. Indigenous knowledge is there. We have it. What's missing is the platform. Um, bringing this in the context of Tibet, um, Tibet and Tibetan issues, Tibetan studies is like a multi-million dollar industry. <laughs> it is. It's like you see a lot of, no offense to those of you here, but a lot of old <laughs> white men who take up a lot of, like they sit on big fat tenured seats. And the number of Tibetans I actually know who have these type of positions, it's like maybe one or two in the entire world. It's like very far and few in be few between. And what Dr. Losanla was saying earlier, you know, we don't even have within India, like how many Tibetan students do we have? How many Tibetan university students? Like even look at TPI. We have all these Tibetan doctorate students doing all this TPI research, but we don't have any proper like tenured seats, investments into institutions, um, like programs, departments within uh, universities in India for Tibetan studies. So how do we expect to, you know, how do we expect to, 
actually bring our indigenous knowledge to the forefront if there is no funding, there is no space for this. If all of this airspace is already being taken by mm. these old white men who should, I mean, they are retiring soon and hopefully that retirement <laughs> is, no, it is, and I, no offense to anyone here, but. No offense. It, it will, like, no, but you know, None the taken. next generation, <laughs> The next generation of Tibetan studies should look Tibetan. And the primary resource, like the sources that's being quoted, the sources, all of this, like when you write all these creative pieces and dissertations, all of the sources need to be based in Tibet. Mm. They need to be based in Tibetan language. They need to be based in, you know, we need to have, even when I've been to IATS, um, International Association of Tibetan Studies, which is our biggest platform for Tibetan studies and for Tibetan issues, and even then, the number of panels you see of Tibetans in Tibetan language versus uh, non-Tibetans, it's just, it's a huge gap. And the right investments need to be made for, it, it's not that the knowledge is not there. It's not, that, um, it's not that our people don't know. We know a lot. And our, the platforms and the investment is not being made. Uh, I think I will go uh, to a... Uh a Zoom question first before I throw open the floor. And this might be for, for Ava and David. Um, it says, uh, what specific actions can industrialized countries take to promote climate change mitigation and adaptation in pre-industrialized countries beyond money? So, you know, when you were speaking, both of you, I, it struck me that, so how, how do these models apply for countries like India or Nepal or Philippines? Um, uh, Eva, you first. Um, sure, thanks. I have to say I'm not um, a policy expert here, so uh, and I think Daniel probably has um, a lot more to say from the, the perspective of <laughs> um, his academic research, but um, I do have some uh, thoughts and suggestions. Of course, there's always a lot of talk about um, knowledge and technology transfer, which I think is a really big thing, um, but there's also the problem of uh, how do you do that without being neo-colonial or um, you know, imposing certain things. And I think that that's still something that uh, has to be worked out in more detail. One of the thoughts that we had was to create at some point this, um, this kind of uh, campus, right? Like a, a campus that's a demonstration ground of not just the most um, advanced um, sustainable technologies in terms of building and energy and recycling, et cetera, but also social technologies. So an experimental space for testing out things like universal basic income or, uh, you know, liquid democracy practices. And with a campus like that, where you also have a space to um, generate, um, um, yeah, new ventures and new initiatives, you could have like visiting scholars programs and have people from around the world come and um, also share their knowledge and um, explain how they would adapt certain things to their context and perhaps like set up a network of these campuses. Metabolic has a foundation uh, with the model of the foundation is that actually um, we support local um, uh, local people in, in their own context to actually develop programs of their own um, and provide them with support. So, um, you know, like that, that's not quite money, but it's also providing different kinds of support to, to people who are um, in a particular context, because there is this, it's a really important line of not smothering um, uh, kind of local and indigenous knowledge. And I also wanted to ask all of you who are speaking about this, like one of my big fears is that indigenous knowledge is um, getting lost because it's getting smothered or it's getting um, overwritten by, uh, by all the kind of um, yeah, existing powers within the academic institutions. But so this knowledge transfer thing, I think, is quite important. But then, how? It, but it, a two-way knowledge transfer, and how do you do it in a way that is, um, um, yeah, empowering and providing additional support in addition to money? Um, and uh, I guess that's one of the, that's the one thought that I would share now. I'm curious to see what Daniel has to say from a more sophisticated policy and academic perspective. David, you'd like to add? Yes, um, well, thank you, but that's, that's too generous. Um, I mean, I guess a couple of things. Uh, one maybe is providing resources and the other would be withdrawing harm. So on providing resources or sharing resources, I think what Eva said about technology transfer is key. I mean, you just go back to the, to the beginning of the UNFCCC 
United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the countries of the global south that have been asking for ages for a transfer of green technology south. And we saw this again during COVID and it's not really happening. Um, so one doesn't want to be patronizing and the you know the global south is a very diverse place with a lot of different kinds of countries, a lot of different kinds of areas with, within them. But I think opening up intellectual property, uh, making as much green technology open source as possible, this seems essential. Transferring resources south for things like develop, developing university centers, all this stuff has happened. But of course, what's helpful in, in Bolivia is very different from what's helpful in a country like India. And of course, you could get into to regions. So I think one thing is just transferring resources south. And the last, the thing I'll just say to that, we just released a report, a climate and community project on debt justice for climate reparations. I mean, we're making the argument that we need substantial uh, cancellation of publicly held uh, debt. You know, most of the highly indebted countries, the, the majority of their debt is publicly held debt. So there's a huge amount that can be done to free up fiscal space for countries to make their own decisions on how to do this. The other thing, quickly reducing harm. I mean, something I'm quite obsessed with. Uh, my mother is Guatemalan, as I mentioned. I do working a lot in America. The drug war is, is huge. If you think about a lot of the climate migration coming out of Latin America, from Central America to the U.S. gets blamed on Central American countries, is traced directly to the drug war. We can even think about things like sustainable agriculture. The Bolivian government, under its policy of coca si, cocaina no, has been begging places like the United States and the European Union to legalize the import of completely non-pharmacological uh, products made with the coca leaf, which would enable community-based agriculture all across um, the parts of the Andes. So there, there's a ton, there's a ton that one can do. I don't think there's any simple silver bullet solution, um, but I think Eva, you, you nailed it, which is there has to be support without paternalism. And uh, that's gonna be a, a challenge that we in the global North need to figure out and get it right. Thank you for that. It just struck me that uh, probably the best example of technology transfer in the last 20 years has been the plummeting prices of photovoltaics and wind turbines and battery technology. I mean, it has been international trade and private sector doing it, but it has happened and it has allowed, you know, people like Terry and others to actually be able to afford uh, renewable systems. Uh, so questions um, from the physical floor. First one with yeah, right here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yankee. I work for an impact-driven real estate uh, company in Canada as well as locations in the U.S. and Europe. So we do recognize the intersectionality of affordability, sustainability, as well as inclusivity. I just wanted to... <coughs> I have a question for Sichidomla. For those of you who don't know, Sichidomla was recognized by Forbes, I think in 2017 or 18, as the most influential 30 under 30. So props <laughs> up to a Tibetan young woman from born in Tibet. So uh, my question to Sichidomla is, um, you know, a lot of the conversations on climate change has been about, you know, first we talk about the Northern Hemisphere, then we talk about uh, addressing it where countries are free. So could you expand a little bit about the challenges of local solutions for Tibetans in Tibet who would like to have local solutions to address climate change, but what are the challenges and barriers there? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. In Tibet, um, I, I think about like all the stories that come out from like all these hidden channels about how um, you know everything from the monasteries to the schools, all these grassroots underground activity for of people, you know, standing up to the mining industry in Tibet, standing up to the nomad relocation, resettlement, displacement. Um, all of this is happening, and we. Those of us in exile, those of us in the free country, we're, we don't even get the full information about what's happening in Tibet in terms of who is standing up, how they're standing up. But the little bits of information that's coming out, we see how religious leaders, community leaders are taking matters into their own hands. Like what we've seen in Larungar, what we've seen in Serta, um, what we've seen in Amdongaba. Um, in these communities, we're seeing how you know, 
communities are trying to understand what's happening. You know, we're trying to understand Tibetans inside Tibet are trying to understand how climate change is happening within their cultural knowledge context. And then using that information, I see a lot of um, community leaders dispersing that information in a localized way. And then community members then stepping up to do a lot of grassroots community-based work. And then eventually uh, some of this like, reaches a tipping point where it results in deaths, it results in, in imprisonment. And those of us out here, we feel so helpless most of the time. We feel so helpless and we just wait for, what do we do? We just put out reports about it. We just try to um, share it on social media platforms, but, but it's just such a bleak situation. It's such a bleak situation and the Chinese government just continues to cover all of it up. Yeah, um, another Zoom question because I don't see any hands yet. Um, in what ways can climate activists around the globe, especially from indigenous communities, incorporate mental and emotional well-being into their movement uh, to build strategies and avoid burnout? Um, Shia, would you like to go with that first? And Elizabeth, if you want to chip in later, and also you too. So this is a crucial question because in a movement, the most important thing is the resilience of the movement, the sustenance of the movement, and knowing that things are not going to change from one strike to the next, but over a long period of time when we're pushing and we're showing up and we're challenging the status quo. And in indigenous communities, it is known that you have to take care not only of yourself, and we've talked a lot about self-care, especially with the pandemic, but it's also about community care and that um, kind of connection that we owe to each other. Um, and so it is really important uh, in the activism space to foster that community, to uh, live in a regenerative culture instead of an extractive culture. And knowing that it is okay to step down, it is okay to just do how, whatever you can and that is enough. You know, I often say that the world doesn't need a thousand perfect climate activists. It needs millions of people doing their best. And activism looks different for different people. Um, but we cannot make this movement last unless we take care of ourselves. We take care of burnout and we take care of, um, of uh, the community members around us. And I think one of the ways in which uh, we can realize that taking care of ourselves is to really talk about you know the climate crisis uh is a very heavy topic uh so it has to be um framed around solutions and imagination and that power that we have to build a better world and i think that youth are especially good at imagining the future in a positive light because it is what we uh what we deserve and what we have been uh, asking for and so a huge part of taking care of your physical and mental well-being is to be able to go towards a goal that is tangible and a goal that is bright and a goal that is, you know, uh, like regenerative. So um, that is what I will say. And I know Elizabeth will have wonderful uh, additions to, to my comment. Invitation to you, Elizabeth. I was actually not going to make any addition because she has just nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I feel Switch a little, um, sometimes I feel a little conflicted about this, like um, in terms of like self care, because I mean, like, as we're sitting here in this conference, like, you know, um, I know like at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I need to go to the bar and get a drink or something because I'm like, I'm so tired from sitting all day and listening to talks and then having a lunch buffet and drinking tea all day. And then I look outside, just outside the window, and I see the day laborers, you know, who are just doing construction work all day long. And then I think about my stress level and like running a nonprofit, being responsible for people's, um, people's livelihoods. But then I compare it to like my mom, you know, my mom who works like 
well, not anymore, but like at one point she was working 16 hours a day, like cleaning motels. And then before that, you know, she was toiling in the Kumbu region, um, growing potatoes and working as a porter for I don't know how many hours a day. And so then, you know, when my mom is like, what do you mean you're tired? You've just been in front of a computer typing all day. <laughs> what do you mean you're tired? What do you mean you're stressed out? You know, you're not like trying to, um, yeah, like when I compare it to those situations, yes, it is like those of us who are youth activists, those of us, you know, we get to do, it's pretty easy compared to what the day laborers are doing right outside the window. It's pretty easy compared to what our ancestors have done. But then at the same time, yes, taking care of yourself, taking care of your community, that is at the forefront. Like even with our nonprofit, we're always trying to, you know, do as much um, informal activities as possible because collaboration is key to keeping the momentum, um, the momentum, the momentum alive. And with COVID, it's just been so hard not seeing people, uh, um, people in person. And yeah, it can be very dragging, but. At the end of the day, when you compare it to what people before you have done and what other, um, like what other people are still doing outside your window, um, it's, it's not quite the same. Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah please. Uh, because what I feel is, you know, the transition, as I mentioned in our program, it was a basic lighting program 17 years back then it reached to livelihood and now it's integrated. So transition should happen in such a manner which should meet the need. And, and uh, even if you, you see that today 5G, 6G, 7G is coming in telephone and, and mobile sets. So do we actually need that or not? Are we uh, totally used to this 4G? Then we are shifting to 5G. So we're creating such a demand which either is not required or is being a forced demand uh, by, the, by, by the corporates or the phone companies. Even uh, today as I see in fact, you know, uh, uh, the potato growers are, you know, vanishing. Why they're vanishing? Because, uh, the, because you know, uh, they're not being taken care of or the conditions are not uh, conducive for them or the income levels are not there. So therefore, we are having a st uh, very, very uh, ch big challenge on food security aspect and that is uh, uh, directly related to climate change also. Like today, in fact, we have the fans in use. Uh, that's our need. But we have made AC our, our, our need uh, uh, as on today. And that is again posing climate change. So we need to uh, take a call and, and food for thought for everyone where we want to go. Thanks. Actually, uh, since we didn't get any questions on the floor, I was going to ask Kaniela, uh, for someone who has transitioned from politics uh, to uh, local action, and then I get this question on Zoom, uh, which says exactly the same thing. Uh, Kaniela, do you feel you were more effective, efficient as an activist and mobilizer, or as a politician? Uh, could you please elaborate the advantages and limitations of being in those two respective positions? Okay, I'll be brief. Um, that link I, I shared about that um, Indigenous Systems article I wrote actually gets into this towards the end. Um, so there's going to be more there. But in terms of moving policy, like we were, we were on the vanguard in terms of like uh, climate justice and climate action uh, in the U.S. Uh, but once implementation happened, it really showed where the gaps are, and we realized how how these powerful institutions, even though we're able to pass it, despite their opposition, they're able to chip away at it um, during implementation to the point where 10 years later, um, we're actually emitting more carbon than we were back then, um, even though, um, you know, we, we're, we're supposed to be on our way towards 100% renewable. Um, and I think in places where there's like a strong sense of community organizations like Daniel and, um, I think a few folks spoke about, Jie uh, spoke about as well. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, in places where there's a strong co-governance between community organizations and politicians, I'm sure you can do a lot more. In Hawaii, there was just a massive dearth of organizing. So, you know, I, I was the left flank or I was the environmental flank. And, and like there was no but, there was no flank of community members behind me. And my office actually had to go out and organize people. We had to go into communities that were hit by in politicians. I would 
um, during, during interims, I'd be knocking on doors myself outside of my own district, um, not asking for votes, but asking for people to come out with these issues. We'd have a, a bill for like a living wage, for example, and everyone testifying were just experts and lawyers. There are no actual wage workers. So we had to actually go and wait outside a, a grocery store until the workers finish their shifts and try to organize them ourselves. Um, so, you know, in, in that regard, just based on that dearth of, of organizing in, in my community, I, I just wasn't, I wasn't able to be effective no matter how good I was at legislating or how good I thought I was at legislating, um, all the power was stacked against me. So, um, you know, I, I felt like from the outside, I, I'd have more, I, I could change that more. Um, and I'm sure a lot of politicians have, have run up to this. You're taught that, you know, power is monolithic and if you wanna make change, run for something, but power is social. And if you wanna make change, organize. Um, sometimes it's easier to organize from a position of power, like an elected official. Sometimes it's easier to organize as a uh, directly impacted community member. Um, but the point is, like, how many people can you bring into the movement? Thank you, Ken Yor. Um, since uh, there aren't too many other questions, we have around 10 minutes. I'd like to give two minutes to each of the speakers to talk about anything you think we left out or maybe comment on any of the other panelists and what they've said and react to that. Um, I don't know, I might call on Eva first and Daniel, uh, then Shie, then Kaniela and Amit and Sechu. So uh, Eva, would you like to go first? Um, sure. I also think that maybe uh, we can also have just a bit of a conversation rather than um, a lot of monologues, because there are lots of things that I've heard that have been, you know, really triggering and interesting. Um, and I guess I'm also wondering from the other uh, panelists, um, I'm curious what your level of optimism is right now. Like if you reflect on how we're, well we're doing and how far we still need to go, and obviously it's a huge mountain to climb, um, but I, I'm just wondering from a personal perspective how, how you're feeling. Um, there was a really, in, I don't know how many of you watched this show called Kurzgesagt. It's, it's like an online web comic thing, um, but they do, uh, you know, they um, do exposés in really interesting <clears throat> formats. And they recently had one on that was very optimistic about the climate, uh, about climate change. It was basically what they said is that actually, despite all the lobbying, despite all the uh, resistance and politics, if you look at the actual trends that have resulted from voluntary actions in industry and, and public pressure from activists, that um, we've gotten to the point where, yes, we're not on track for a 1.5 degree world, but we're on track for a three degree world, which is still not great, but it's so much better than uh, 10 years ago. And, you know, that was in some ways, um, yeah, rousing. I, I guess it was like, that that's a positive thing in some ways. Of course, we need to keep doing more. We need to keep doing a lot more, but there is, the needle is moving. So personally, I, I, I like what Christiana Figueres says and Tom Karnak, their, their phrase, um, stubborn optimism. I am a stubborn optimist. Um, and that's, that's the only way that I can lead an organization every day into, uh, of young people going into, uh, into this fight over and over and over again, um, as it, continues to look very difficult, but there's also glimmers of hope and that's how I feel right now. And I'm just wondering whether you share my perspective. <laughs> Good point for the reaction from the others as well. Uh, I like to say uh, myself, being from Nepal, that I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist, um, both about my own country, my region, as well as uh, climate issues. Um, Daniel? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I think um, what I take from someone else who's written on this, Rebecca Solnit, is that being hopeful isn't an interpretation of the future. It's just a better way to get out of bed in the morning. Um, <laughs> and I think that's that's where I am. Um, a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, I you know, we don't know what the temperature will be. The situation in a lot of ways is a bit bleak. I think what's accurate is that we're not heading necessarily towards an RCP 8.5 world of maximum climate breakdown, probably not, although we, do, we can't know for sure. But I think we are cruising toward a world of eco-apartheid that's even deeper than before. And that I think is it's clarifying. It's not just, as I think somebody else said earlier, I think it might have been Coniel, it's not just about the parts per million carbon in the atmosphere. It is that and how are we going to cope with this? You know, there was a study that, you know, the difference in uh, number of people exposed to extreme 
temperature and shock at two degrees Celsius boils down to the to investments that are made in adaptation and, and decarbonization and community resiliency. So to me, the um, the really big fight in the years to come is between something resembling democracy and, and eco-apartheid. Um, a totally different thought. Um, I really appreciated this conversation. And I think something I've been thinking about in the last few weeks, probably sparked actually by reading a ton of Kim Stanley Robinson novels during the pandemic. I know he's around somewhere. But something I've been thinking is that we need more of a get together between the activists, the social scientists, and the engineers. I think there's been a lot in climate knowledge has come from atmospheric science and other earth sciences, and then a very narrow kind of climate economics. But the people who are physically remaking the world, which is what this whole thing is about, very often have engineering expertise and background. And in universities are totally siloed from social scientists. And even if we can cross the campus, uh, you don't see a ton of activists there. And often people in the climate justice movement will tell me that you know they just don't feel like they have the time or the expertise to evaluate every new technology coming down the pipe. So I think one of the things I would love to see, and you know, just thinking about this conversation back and forth with Eva and with others on this panel, how can we have a more robust dialogue between people who are really focused on the people side of this equation, people focus on the systems and the things and have more trust and more information flow and just um, more, more constant exchange. Because I, I really worry about a world where the people who worry the most about justice don't sit in the same room as the people who are figuring out new ways to move energy through wires, through buildings, new ways to move materials around with gigantic machines. So that's, that's a bit of a crossroads I'm hoping to see more of, and I'm grateful for the organizers for generating a bit of that uh, on this panel today. Daniel, um, your final thoughts, um, Shia? Well, I, I agree with Eva on the stubborn optimism side. I think that that framework has really informed the way that I see my role, uh, which is something that was also mentioned before, you know, like own your place in the movement and know that it's, it's our purpose to be here. And if, if weather and we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be doing all the work that we do. I have spent the last four days camping in my university to ask my university to divest. Um, the numbers have grown from 15 students camping to 40. And I don't know what numbers were last night because I am in New York City now. But in just my school, the, the exponential growth of the people who are organizing and the people who join and then the faculty members who join and the faculty members who, to Daniel's point, are joining from the social sciences, the environmental science, um, philosophy. You know, I took a class on environmental ethics and that professor was showing up. So it's really about that collaboration aspect that we've been missing. And if there is one thing that I want to end um, this participation with is just knowing that all of you are supposed to be here and we're supposed to be part of this movement together. And the best thing that we can do is uh, listen to each other because we are in, in this for the long run. And I cannot wait to see you all again in all the different spaces that we're gonna share. Thank you, Gia. Kaniela? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have a three-year-old. So, and we, you know, we chose to have kids and um, a three-year-old and a six-year-old, but at least as of, I guess, three and a half years or four years ago, we were very, very optimistic. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're bringing a child into this world today, um, you're, you're inherently optimistic. Uh, we, parents aren't in the movement in the, in the ways that we need to be. Um, we will do anything to protect our kids, um, but there's this really dire, like imminent threat that we just don't take as seriously as we would any other threat. Um, so that's that's what drives me. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that my boys get to catch their first wave, their first fish in a place like I did right here at home, not have to leave leave because of eco apartheid apartheid. Uh, Daniel's coin term, but you know, it's just like in, in Hawaii, especially, it's only the rich who get to stay here in these fancy sustainable communities and everybody else. There's no suburb here. We just have to go away, um, away from our ancestral lands of 10 generations. Um, I'm feeling that pressure right now, in fact. Uh, so, you know, this transformation isn't just a, 
environmental one. It's a massive economic one. It's a, um, it's a like a gender based one. It's a race based one. If we're going to actually solve this problem, we're kind of have going to have to fix everything because um, we're going to have to get people. We're going to get enough people to scale. Um, like right away, and that's the people from all walks of life. And we don't want it to be a violent revolution, um, a la Ministry of the Future. <laughs> then we need to start now. We need to be having millions of conversations um, with each other. So there's one thing I want to leave folks with. It's yes, technology is good. We need more, but we also have everything we need right now. If we just organize the people power to force politicians to move, um, that will do it. That will do it. And there's just not enough resources going into that arena to build that community power that at least pretty much actually every single one of these panelists talked about. We just need more resources there. Thank you. Can you uh, Amit, very quickly? Yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, I would say that we have only one planet, uh, planet Earth, and we are uh, right now 7.6 billion around, and it will reach to 10 billion uh, in, in the next few years. So that's not a problem. But, each, but if each one of us, in fact, uh, put such an effort and we work in harmony with nature, then there would be no problem. We should, you know, shift from energy intensive to energy resilient solutions. And uh, as uh, His Hol uh, Holiness Dalai Lama Ji said that, uh, you know, uh, 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 peace and prosperity is, is the biggest thing. He, he addressed the entire, entire universe. And if we uh, follow on his lines, and I think uh, all the issues related to uh, uh, climate and, and technologies would, you know, won't be, won't be there to that extent. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful from this uh, conference that uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, set an example uh, uh, for us also and for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sechu. Um, for our youth, climate, um, indigenous activists, um, we are the manifestation of our ancestors' sacrifices. And to restate my favorite quote by Maya Angelou, um, your crown has been bought and paid for, and it's time for you to wear it and own it. And it's time for our allies to make the right investments. Thank you. Um, very stimulating. I'm sure you all agree. Very invigorating, uh, very powerful, very emotional. And uh, as a journalist, you might have seen I was taking furious notes because I was getting lots of ideas, lots of coverage um, um, ideas. And um, I'd just like to plug that at 5 p.m., two hours from now, uh, today here, India time, um, we're going to have Kim Stanley Robinson, the writer of this most recent book, Ministry of the Future, giving us a talk, which will end this uh, two-day conference dialogue for the future. It's been a privilege to uh, moderate both the keynote on the first day as well as uh, this session, this last session. And from an old, white-haired, brown man, um, I... Bye-bye. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a good one. Recording.